A Story of Three Whiteleys, Part 1. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Art Crime International for another episode. Uh, This is your host RJ and it's lovely to see you back. I'm hoping one month I can come to you with great news and that nothing horrifically traumatic has happened, but I don't think that's ever really going to happen now, is it, in the world that we live in? With the UK largely taking away the right to disruptively protest in the UK, the fallout from the Meghan and Harry interview, which rightfully called the royal family racist, like we didn't already know that, the mass shooting in the US targeting Asian Americans, and the Sarah Everard murder by a police officer, this month has had a lot of violence and honestly gives me less and less hope for the future of humanity every day. I can only hope that April will be better, or I'm going to have to find other things than carpet cleaning my house to give me space from the world. Hopefully you have all been finding ways to disassociate from the news if you need to. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, mainly on Jeffrey Epstein and the Maxwell family, as well as Evil by Design, about the Canadian Epstein, Peter Nygaard, who is even worse than Epstein if you can believe it. I'll leave the podcasts I've just recommended in the episode description, so give them a look in, they are really really good. I've also been watching the Cecil Hotel documentary that hit Netflix recently, which may have convinced me it was an accident, but I still have a few questions. And catching up on The Bold Type, which had me crying for the last half of the current season and was a nice distraction from everything going on right now. This month's episode, which was requested from a close friend who was in the same art forgery class with me at university, investigates a very critical possible forgery case from Australia one of only three major art fraud cases that the Australian Criminal Courts has ever dealt with. From this lack of practice, in comparison with the US and the UK that have bigger art markets and therefore more opportunities for forgeries to be discovered, this court case will be a bit of a letdown. I want to use a worse phrase, but I'm trying to keep this episode as family-friendly as possible. This case will also be split into three phases, so we will have this episode which will cover the journey of the forgeries, or suspected forgeries, through the art market and how the art market feels about these works. The second episode will cover the trial surrounding the criminal case, and the third episode will do a deep dive into the history of one of the defendants, Peter Gant, who, let's just say, is not new to the courtroom. So this is a re-upload, which is why the series is out of order, upload-wise, because it was brought to my attention from a commenter that I may be infringing on Aboriginal art copyright law by using the dot technique, which I originally used in my first recreation. I want to thank the commenter for bringing this to my attention, and this is the new recreation of one of Brett Whiteley's Bold Landscapes of Lavender Bay. I want to sincerely apologise for not doing my research properly the first time round, but this was an important reminder to me to be more careful and has provided a new research area that I will most likely look into in the future. Again, I'm very sorry to any Aborigines that may have found my original recreation disrespectful. The British have done enough to the Aborigines without me adding my copyright infringement into the mix. I will also throw this in here that there is a content warning for the beginning of this episode as the artist in question, Brett Whiteley, whose artworks are possibly forged in this case, was a drug user so there may be mention of drug taking and his death in this episode, so if you are triggered I'll let you know at what points to skip through. Before I get into the case itself, I just have a little bit of legalese to say also, due to the fact that, spoiler alert, this case is acquitted, I will be saying alleged forgery as I don't want to be sued by our two defendants, that is if they have the money to do so. I mean, they are not going to get anything from me, a broke graduate, unless they want to inherit my student loan debt, and that's not even how it works, but I'd rather avoid any legal nonsense. Now let's get into this frustrating case. This first part of the trilogy will concern the alleged creation and evidence journey of three works that have been allegedly attributed to Brett Whiteley, a prominent Sydney-based artist from the 1970s and 80s, who used bold acrylic colours to represent beautiful native landscapes like Lavender Bay, which became the muse for his most famous collection of works. The works, however, have now meant that the view of Lavender Bay is also now synonymous with the most prominent alleged forgeries in Australian criminal history in the 21st century. Although beloved by some critics like James Gleeson, who believed he shone as no other Australian artist has ever shone, Whiteley's controversial life, and here is your trigger warning, so skip ahead about 15 seconds, with his dependency on alcohol and addiction to heroin, leading to Whiteley's eventual death in 1992 from a heroin overdose in a motel room in Thirrell, New South Wales, at the age of 53, and his reputation for introducing others to the drug, like his wife Wendy and the wife of art critic Robert Hughes, have led to some critics like Patrick McCaughey denoting his career a story of squandered genius. 
Whiteley's works within the art market are incredibly popular, especially with new money investors who are looking for strong Australian artists to invest and resell for profit. His works in the 2000s, when this case began, were regularly selling for millions, only increasing with their notoriety, whether they were deemed as the better Whiteley's or if they were of specific subjects, such as his Lavender Bay series from the 1970s or his Birds exhibition series from 1988. However, the recent monetary increase in the global art market has meant that forgers looking to make a quick buck have become a more significant problem within the art market and the subject of various documentaries, books and podcasts. In my personal opinion, I think this story would make a great documentary like Made You Look, which is about the Nodler Gallery scandal, although the majority of this case takes place in the court system, so it may need to take a law and order direction with it to make the court case a little bit more interesting. Now let's take this story back to the very beginning, from the research of investigative journalist Gabriela Kolsovich in her book Whiteley on Trial, which follows her interviews with key individuals and journey reporting on the case from its initial media reports all the way up to after the trial. The majority of this episode and the perspectives of the key individuals involved are taken from her book, either from her private interviews with them or from their testimonies on the stand. If the statements I repeat are from elsewhere, I will cite the source as and when, but most of it is from Kolshevich's book. During the winter of 2007 in Australia, sometime between June and August for all of my Northern Hemisphere audience, because I knew I was confused, Judd Wimhurst, an employee at Victoria Art Conservation in Collingwood, Melbourne, unlocks the building to see the storeroom next to his boss's office open. Wimhurst worked at Victoria Art Conservation for two years, three days a week making frames, stretching canvases, varnishing paintings and building display plinths for artworks. His boss, Aman Sadiq, a Ugandan national who had set up Victoria Art Conservation in 2002, was a largely well-liked and respected conservator in Australia, who was very secretive with his storeroom, keeping it locked at all times. Wimhurst, worried that someone had broken in overnight, went to check out the room and found several Brett Whiteley-style artworks in progress. This seemed odd to Wimhurst, as the building had great security and all their other artworks remained out in the workshop, not packed away overnight in case of burglaries, so why would these Whiteleys be treated any differently? Wimhurst was also confused, as these works didn't look like artworks that were being restored, and looked more like potential conservation experiments, which Sadiq was known to do for some jobs to double-check the techniques that he was using before he did them on the actual works, but they just didn't look right to be just experiments. Rather than bringing it up to Sadiq, Wimhurst mentioned it to his workmate, Guy Morrill, a bookbinder and paper conservator, about whether he had seen any Whiteleys being worked on. Morrill had not, and felt that it was also suspicious. Alongside this, Morrill had previously shown Wimhurst a piece of paper with multiple practices of Australian artist Fred Williams' signature, and both had noticed oddly sized wood panel door deliveries that were taken into the storeroom, which were apparently for notorious art dealer Peter Gant's new home, but were also well known to be materials that Whiteley painted on. A few months later, as his artistic career began to take off, Wimhurst left Victoria Art Conservations, but Guy Morrill continued to investigate a little more, by occasionally standing on a chair and hanging a camera over the stockroom wall to keep an eye on the progress of the works, because the stockroom didn't quite reach the ceiling, so there was a big enough gap that he could hook a camera over it and just have a quick peek to see what was going on. He even managed to get inside the stockroom once and took photos at close range, documenting three Brett Whiteley style paintings. The first one, Orange Lavender Bay, is a large orange bay scene with a few small birds, a white pier and small yachts in the centre of the wooden panelling. The second, Big Blue Lavender Bay, shows a similar scene with a large blue background with a few yellow oak palm trees in the foreground, a long white pier through the centre, surrounded by small yachts once again. It also has two other piers coming from the left-hand side towards the centre, with the sides of the bay visible in the top left-hand corner and along the right-hand side of the wooden panel. The third work, Lavender Bay Through the Window, has since gone missing, so I can't give you an accurate description for what it most probably looked like, but it will fit within this over of yachts, piers and a sweeping bright background. On the 4th of September 2007, an anonymous tip, later revealed to be Guy Morrill, was submitted to Detective Sergeant James MacDonald, asking for advice on how to report a large-scale art fraud. 
Although in countries with a bigger art market, like the US and the UK, where this would have been directed to one of their various art fraud teams, Australia does not have one, and so was handled largely by MacDonald himself, in a very minimal investigation due to the lack of interest from his superiors, who didn't see any point in investigating the case. After some discussions with Morrill, on the 5th of October 2007, Detective MacDonald went undercover into Victoria Art Conservations to meet Morrill and toured the place. They managed to get inside the storeroom and saw the following items. Firstly, a large unframed Brett Whiteley painting, which he assumed was original, depicting a view of Sydney Harbour through a window with a white vase shape on the base of the window frame. Number two, a smaller, similar style of painting with a white vase shape lying on the floor of the storeroom. And thirdly, a larger painting in progress, also in the style of Whiteley, with blue water, white buildings, a pier and three palm trees, which was balanced on two large cans on the storeroom floor. From deductions and further research, we can assume that the paintings that the detective saw were View from the Sitting Room Window, Lavender Bay, from 1991, a confirmed Whiteley that art dealer Peter Gant had purchased at auction in March of 2007 for 1.65 million Australian dollars. Known as the brown painting within this trial and in the art market, this work has a divisive history, as it is viewed by Wendy Whiteley, Whiteley's ex-wife, inheritor of his estate and main authority on Whiteley's works, as a bad hair day Whiteley, being the last Lavender Bay piece painted by Whiteley that had been authenticated so far using photographic provenance. The smaller work of a similar style is most likely Lavender Bay Through the Window, the work that is currently missing, which some experts who believe the work is a forgery think may have been directly inspired by the authenticated work View from the Sitting Room Window, Lavender Bay. The third work, with its blue water and yellow palm trees, is thought to be the other controversial painting, Big Blue Lavender Bay. Now this is where the case largely goes quiet due to the lack of interest from senior police officials, which leads the case to stagnate until 2014. However, some of you may be wondering, where was the orange Lavender Bay work that I mentioned earlier if it wasn't in this stockroom? Well, let's direct our attention and go for a ride through the art market process until we arrive back in 2014 with a case to be had against conservator Aman Sadiq and the notorious art dealer Peter Gant. Peter Gant is a well-known and sometimes well-respected art dealer from Australia, depending on who you ask. Some dealers and gallerists swear by his knowledge and his charitability within the art market, as shown by the character references that came forward during his acquittal trial. But Gabriela Kolshevich, within her book, does make sure to highlight that Gant has fraud hearings, civil lawsuits and bankruptcy declarations dating all the way back to the 1980s. Although I won't go into these cases more here, keep your eyes peeled for episode 3 in this mini-series where I'll deep dive into the history of Gant. Just keep in mind that this is not Gant's first time dealing with court cases against him, and not the first time he has declared himself bankrupt to avoid having to pay people back. Even though Gant is seen by some in the art market as an untrustworthy individual, there are still some that trusted his opinion in 2007, and some still do even now. This is where the art market gets incredibly dodgy in my opinion, but that is a discussion for a later date. One of these individuals that was willing to trust Gant, even though she was aware of the risks, was Anita Archer, an art dealer and previous chief auctioneer for Australian auction house Deutsche & Hackett. Taken from her testimonies in court, as well as the 2015 interview she gave to Kolshevich between the preliminary and jury trial, this is how she characterises her interaction with Gant and the sale of Big Blue Lavender Bay, one of the paintings allegedly shown in Morrill's photos of Sadiq's storeroom. In 2007, the art market was going mad in Australia, in a similar way as it was in the UK and the US at the time, largely because money and finance was going really well, so art naturally does better when the financial situation is doing better. With dealers fighting each other to get leads for their clients and to find the best works to bring to market, when she was approached by Gant about a work he was trying to sell. In 2006, Gant had originally told Archer that he had a Whiteley Lavender Bay coming up for sale in a year's time that was part of the collection of one of his biggest clients, Robert Letet, a venture capitalist and media mogul who was a well-known art collector in the Australian market. 
Due to this provenance story, Archer felt slightly more confident that this work was an authentic piece, which Gant had been able to find previously, and was interested when he confirmed with her in November of 2007 that the work was ready for sale. When she saw the work on the 23rd of November, she didn't think it was a great Whiteley, but that the 2.5 million Australian dollar price tag for a work by Whiteley of this size and date was pretty reasonable, as it was not from the original 1970s series, or of an exceptionally high quality, which would have cost a lot more. A few days after viewing the work, she sent pictures taken by Gant's assistant, after she realised the ones that she had taken were blurry, to Brett Lichtenstein, Whiteley's framer, who he had used for the majority of his career. Archer's version of this conversation, although it is not in writing, is that Lichtenstein stated that the frame was his, and that he recognised the picture in the frame. This did seem odd to Archer, as Gant never mentioned that it was a Lichtenstein frame, which in the art world almost guarantees that the work is an authentic Whiteley from the period, if it has the signature water-gilded 23 karat gold agate burnished wooden frame that Lichtenstein is known for and that Whiteley preferred. These frames are also very significant because water gilding is a very difficult and time consuming process to accomplish and Lichtenstein at this point in time in Australian art history was one of the only people that was doing it and was known to do it. So if that frame is on that Whiteley, for most dealers that is seen as a sign of authenticity. Obviously things can change within 20-30 years as we will see but it's usually a pretty good sign if you find a Whiteley in a Lichtenstein frame. Lichtenstein's recollection of this discussion, however, is quite different, as he told Archer that he couldn't tell from a photo if it was his frame, but that he was willing to look at the work if she wanted. Archer never took him up on this offer, and he was told that Wendy Whiteley had confirmed the piece was authentic, so he did not push any further. On the 27th of November, Archer emailed her hopeful buyer Andrew Preedham, an investment banker and Sydney Swans chairman, who had been using Archer as his art advisor since 2005 to create a colonial Australian art collection, which he felt would also be a good investment. Alongside the photos, she included the provenance that she knew so far from Gant, who she didn't mention as her contact to Preedham, that the work was in La Tête's collection and had been bought directly from Whiteley in 1988 when the work was made through his studio assistant Christian Quintas, who had passed away before this case came to trial and is therefore unavailable to confirm or deny these claims. In a phone call on the 28th, Freedom said he would pay 2.5 million Australian dollars for the work and sent the $100,000 deposit to Archer, who passed it on to Gant to secure the sale. In mid-December, he paid for the work and had it installed in his home. Preedham enjoyed the work until April 2008, so a couple months later, when he invited Wendy Wiley to morning tea at his home. In his interview with Kolshevich, he stated that he never told Wendy that the purpose of her visit was to look at Big Blue Lavender Bay, but he and Henry Mulholland, his auctioneer and artist friend, both watched her reaction very closely. Wendy did not seem impressed with the work, and did not recognise it, or did not indicate that she recognised it. This is unsurprising for a work that was allegedly made during the period that Wendy and Brett were getting divorced, as he was apparently hiding works from the courts, selling works to be able to afford his court fees and his drug habit, and she was also not involved in the studio like she previously had been, so she emailed Lichtenstein to get his opinion. He told her what he had said to Archer, that he wasn't sure if he recognised the frame or the painting, and that Archer had never asked him to come look at the work to confirm but that he had been told that Wendy had looked at it and said it was real, which she obviously hadn't. Although she didn't say anything directly to Prudem, as she wasn't sure herself, and she knew he had spent a lot of money on the work, Prudem was still suspicious and emailed Archer asking to speak to Latet directly. The next month, Wendy herself phoned Archer, concerned about the work and wanting to see the provenance for this Whiteley, and the confirmation from Lichtenstein that it was his frame on the work, which Archer promised she would collect an email. From both of these inquiries, Archer then had to go on a provenance hunt after the point of sale to help prove the dubious authenticity of the work. She started with asking Lichtenstein if he had any documents for his framing, but unfortunately, due to a fire or flood, Archer couldn't remember. All of Lichtenstein's records from that year had been destroyed. She also emailed Gant to try and get a statement from Letet proving its provenance, which he said he would do. For five months, there was radio silence from Gand, so on the 28th of October 2008, she drafted the statement herself and emailed it to Gant's assistant for him to fill in the gaps and get Letet to sign it. This statement, which was edited and returned by Gant, 
listed that Latet had bought two paintings from Whiteley's studio in August of 1988 after spending six months discussing possible works with Christian Quintus. It also stated that Latet had sent the work to Victoria Art Conservation, Sadiq's conservation workshop, before being put on the market to be cleaned, and that during this process, the original frame was taken off and a new frame ordered and put on due to damage. Although a good provenance, the statement was signed but undated by Latet, and without other provenance to send, Archer faxed it to Wendy and presumed that everything was fine due to the lack of response. And everything remained fine for two years until the scandal surrounding one of the other works reached the news. Whilst Prudham was doubting his Whiteley's provenance, another one of the suspect Whiteley's was making its way out into the art market and into the home of Sydney luxury car dealer and small-time art dealer Stephen Nestetsky. In December 2009, Nestetsky was approached by Sydney art dealer Andrew Crawford about a Whiteley Lavender Bay artwork, which he had gotten from Melbourne dealer John Playfoot, who had the work on consignment from Gant, although Playfoot did not disclose this information to anyone else at the time. This is quite a common occurrence in the art market, that a dealer will reach out to another dealer maybe in a different area. So, for example, a Sydney dealer will reach out to a Melbourne dealer to ask them about whether they might have more success or knew of anybody in their area that might want the work. And so you may get other dealers to help you sell the work and use as a intermediary for you to reach out to a wider audience. So this is pretty common. Gant and Playfoot had previously been involved in other deals, some very questionable, which will be covered in episode 3 on Gant. In my opinion, he should have known better before working again with Gant. However, Playfoot fell into the same provenance story that Archer did, that the work came from the collection of Robert Letet, which he later inferred to Crawford and was eventually passed on to Nestetsky, the hopeful buyer, when he was shown the work on the 5th of December 2009. Crawford argues that once he was shown the work by Playfoot, he was unconvinced that the work was an authentic Whiteley, as he had seen hundreds and his gut instinct was telling him something was wrong. To prove his instinct, Crawford started to investigate the work, firstly by asking art conservator David Stein and Sydney dealer Dennis Saville to look at the work. Both believed initially that the work was just a bad Whiteley, as it was in a Lichtenstein frame and had too many iconographic hallmarks, in their opinion, to think it was a fake at first. But the longer they looked at it, the more unnatural the work looked, as if someone was blocking out the areas and filling them in, rather than painting them in a flow of decision making and editing along the way as the painting process continued, like Whiteley would have done. Although there are elements of that, which is called pentamenti, in the process of these works, it's unnatural or it feels unnatural to some experts in these artworks, and so it's a little bit questionable. In Crawford's interview with Kolchevich, he personally suggests that the works look like an amalgam of big orange, in brackets, sunset, and view from the sitting room window, Lavender Bay, the first being one of Whiteley's most beloved Lavender Bay works, and the second being the Lavender Bay work that Gant purchased in 2009. Alongside asking other connoisseurs for their opinion on Orange Lavender Bay's artistic authenticity, Crawford also asked Playfoot for more proof of provenance, aside from the inferred story that it was from a wealthy private collector in Melbourne, which is meant to be known as La Tete. Playfoot sent along two pieces of provenance, a catalogue for a Peter Gant Fine Art Gallery exhibition from 1988, which was cancelled, called A Private Affair, and a consignment listing from Gant's art gallery showing three Whiteley works, all which came to be suspected later down the line from around the same period. Like any good dealer, Crawford tried to find the A Private Affair catalogue in a public library record and couldn't find any, which seemed a little suspicious and also took the work to Wendy to get a second opinion. She was unconvinced that the work was by Whiteley. Crawford remained suspicious of the work and went to Nestetsky's house at 7.30 in the morning only a few days after introducing the work to him and delivered a letter, which he asked Nestetsky to sign, advising him not to proceed with the purchase of Orange Lavender Bay for Crawford's own liability in case the work was found to be a fake later down the line. Unfortunately, on the 8th of December 2009, three days after being shown the work and subsequently advised not to buy it, Nestetsky offered 1.1 million Australian dollars to Playfoot, subject to a viewing of the work in person. The offer was accepted, and over the next few months, until the end of February in 2010, Nestetsky made instalments to pay for the work to Playfoot, 
and Playfoot sent a letter detailing the provenance and the A Private Affair catalogue to Nestetsky to help him with future provenance research or sale of the work. Whilst Orange Lavender Bay and Big Blue Lavender Bay made their way into the private collections of wealthy individuals, the third alleged forgery, which is still missing, took an alternative route through the art market and one that I think may become a more common occurrence now that art has begun to be seen as an investment opportunity in a similar way to property. The missing work, Lavender Bay Through the Window, is denoted as last being in the hands of Melbourne cafe owner and associate of Gant, Guy Angwin. Angwin, admittedly, is not an expert of the art market or the art world, and his cafe was across the road from where Gant had worked, and they struck up a friendship discussing their mutual interest in art. Throughout their friendship, Gant had used Angwin as an investor in art, in a similar way to his client relationship with Le Tet, in that both would finance Gant's purchases within the art market, and that Gant would then resell in a better art market period, or through his other connections, and give them a cut of the profit from these investments. Although it is unknown how much money Latet or Angwin made from these collections, or how much commission Gant gained from these sales, Angwin states that his split was always reinvested back into more expensive art sales, so that gradually Gant could build him an increasingly better art collection. However, this changed in 2007, when Gant asked Angwin for a large loan of 950000 Australian dollars to go towards a larger purchase. This is not money that Angwin had at hand, but as he trusted Gant, after knowing him for 18 years by this point, he decided to take out a loan against his family home and handed the money over to Gant, who told him in a verbal agreement that he would repay him with a $200,000 deposit and then with interest on the balance until it was paid. However, unsurprisingly to us, Gant never paid him back or met any of the supposed deposits, even though Angwin would call it a minimum once a week to find out when he was getting his money. Due to this lack of money, he eventually had to sell his home to pay back the debt as he couldn't afford his own loan repayments against his home. However, in September of 2010, Gant offered him lavender bay through the window as a pacifier and insurance on the debt telling Angwin that the work was worth more than the loan. It is unknown how long the work remained with Angwin, but from his statements, after he gave it back to Gant later that year, the work went to Gant's lawyer John Ribbond, and that is the last time that Angwin saw the work and has never seen the money from Gant. Ribbons confirms that the artwork was in his office building for a period, as he would hold onto works as storage for Gan and as a rotating display of new art in his office, before someone removed the work sometime in 2011. He presumes Gan or someone working for Gan, and the work has never been seen since. So now that we have heard the story of the mysterious missing work, let's see how the other two works became contentious pieces within the art market. A month after purchasing Orange Lavender Bay, Nestetsky tried to sell it, hoping to achieve at least a half a million dollar profit on the work, which had been his main intention when buying it in the first place. He took the work to auction house Deutsche & Hackett in March of 2010 and asked them to sell it for him. Alongside the painting, the auction house also took the A Private Affair catalogue to have it tested to prove its authenticity. Their testing found that the catalogue was a digital print made after 2003, not the original catalogue, and in their opinion was not solid enough as provenance for them to confirm that the work was a genuine Whiteley and could not be sold at auction as such. Hearing this, Nastetsky started reaching back out to Crawford and Playfoot, as well as Wendy, to gain further opinions from them, or to gain some form of provenance that he could use to prove the authenticity of the work. In his phone call with Wendy, she mentioned that she had already spoken to Crawford and that she was totally unhappy with the provenance and did not believe the work was by Whiteley. However, Nastetsky, unimpressed with Wendy's negative opinion and looking to get a second one, asked around to see who else would be trustworthy. Someone suggested Framer Brett Lichtenstein, and so Nastetsky invited him down to his home to look at Orange Lavender Bay. Lichtenstein, in his recollection, told Nastetsky that he didn't recognise the work, that it may have been from one of Whiteley's drug-free periods, as the work looked a little tight and he didn't see all of Whiteley's artworks. However, he was thrown by the fact that one of his frames was on the work. From Nastetsky's recollection of this discussion, he remembers the key point of Lichtenstein saying, that is my frame, I framed it, I remember it, which Lichtenstein doesn't remember saying. After these two opinions, Nastetsky contacted Crawford in May of that year, who advised him to send the work to Robin Sloggett, director of the University of Melbourne's Centre for Cultural Materials Conservation, to have the work forensically tested. 
Playfoot, on the other hand, as he argued in court, told Nastetsky that the catalogue was not original and was a digital print, which Nastetsky was always aware of. During these discussions with Playfoot, Nastetsky filed a police complaint, threatening to push forward with a fraud case against Playfoot if he did not receive his 1.1 million Australian dollars back. To avoid the lawsuit, Playfoot refunded him the money out of his own pocket, even though the original payment had gone straight through Playfoot to Gant, and unsurprisingly to anybody listening, would not refund Playfoot the money himself. Even though Nastetsky got his full repayment back and recanted his police report, Nastetsky still went to the media to expose the alleged forgery ordeal, a rarity amongst most collectors who are too embarrassed or worried about the backlash against their collections to come forward and expose that when they have been tricked by an alleged or proven forgery. This is where Gabriela Kolshevich became acquainted with the case as a reporter at Australian newspaper The Age and became fascinated with the case. However, Gant also began to try to crack down on any publication about this work by threatening to sue the newspaper for libel for several years and largely managed to bury some of the allegations against him about Orange Lavender Bay. However, although the art market may be secretive, it is also filled with gossip and the media did manage to gain some information on a suspect whitely. This led to Predom becoming suspicious of his own work, Big Blue Lavender Bay, in mid-2010, and having Archer arrange for the work to be sent to the Sloggett for testing. In a similar move to Crawford, Archer tried to gain more provenance documents to give to Predom to help with the case for its authentication, and phoned Gant to get Robert Letet's number so that they could talk directly. During the phone call, Letet asked for a picture of the work, which she obviously sent, and says he doesn't recognise it at all. From this, Letet sent a fax to Gant's barrister in August of 2010, requiring a signed statement from Gant that the signed Letet statement that he had given to Archer as provenance for Big Blue Lavender Bay was not signed by him at all. Alarm bells began to ring for Archer, who demanded that Gant refund Predom his money, which, in true Gant style, never happened. Predom then began to threaten to sue Archer to reclaim his money, which he successfully did in 2011. So both of our investors got their money back from their dealers, Gant got away without refunding anyone, both artworks were now doubted by the art market and most of the experts that worked closely with Whiteley's, and one of the artworks disappears without a trace. So how do we end up at trial in 2015? This is where we will hit the end for part one, following the journeys of the three alleged forgeries throughout the art world. Although I don't want to draw too many conclusions just yet from this situation, as the next episode will cover a lot more evidence and discuss two very different theories of this case presented by the defence and the prosecution, I want to leave you all with a question. If you were Archer or Playfoot, working with venture capitalists and art investors willing to put millions on your decisions, would you trust Gan, someone that's had several dealings with court cases for fraud in the past and also has declared bankruptcy several times? And secondly, if you were Nastetsky or Predom, our millionaire investors, would you trust Archer, Crawford or Playfoot again on where you should invest your money? I have my own thoughts, but we can discuss them in part two, which will be heading out at the end of next month. I'll leave all my little end bits until I get to the end of the next episode when we wrap this case up, but until then, stay safe and maybe don't trust people that have declared themselves bankrupt more than once. Bye for now!